hello everybody and um, welcome. Uh, I'm yeah, the sun says I'm in, in Munich, a rather uh, wet, dreary afternoon in Munich. Thank you all very much, um, wherever you are, for attending this uh, webinar on rising to students learning challenges. Uh, and as teachers, I think we're all um, well aware of the challenges that uh, students have in, in trying to learn English or in learning English. And I think a, a, a very important part of our teaching is helping learners to, to rise to those challenges or to overcome those challenges and learn English successfully. Um, given that, a, a, a very essential part of our teaching, I think, is, um, is enabling learning. So it's helping learners uh, to deal with these challenges. So this is really what um, this webinar is about. We'll be looking at uh, the challenges that learners have um, and looking at ways in which we can help learners overcome them and learn more successfully. Um, another aspect of this is that um, quite a lot of course has been written theoretically on this topic and on the topic of, of learning challenges and on learning. And um, so this raises another question, which is how can we apply insights um, from theory and from research to practical everyday teaching in this area? Um, and um, in that connection, I will be referring to what I think is quite, quite an important document produced recently by Cambridge University Press called The Principles of Language Learning. And in this document, they, they drew together, they collected um, theoretical writings and research into language learning and drew together a set of, of principles of successful language learning, which could be used as a resource for, um, for teachers and also for materials writers. So we'll also be looking at that and seeing how we can apply those insights. Um, Yeah. Um, okay, so this is what we're going to do in this webinar then. We're going to look um, uh, in general about at some of the, of the challenges that learners face. And then we're going to look at um, some of the um, ideas from the Cambridge Principles of Language Learning, which I just mentioned. And then we're going to look um, in more detail at certain areas from these principles and see how we can apply them in our teaching to help learners overcome challenges. And in these parts of the talks, I'll be uh, using as an example, um, taking examples from the second edition of Empower, the Cambridge um, Adult Course, uh, which, uh, as Simon mentioned, I am one of the authors of. So what kind of challenges the learners have? And um, if, we, if we talk about challenges, you know, what, what kind of thing are we talking about? Um, just to focus on this, I would like to look with you at some examples of typical learners' comments, which I've experienced, I'm sure you have too. Um, the first one, why do we always do the same old thing? This is a response from a learner, perhaps to the, to the routine of the classroom, um, to routines of learning and a reaction against that. This one, I can't remember the vocabulary we studied last week. Um, a response perhaps to um, the challenges of, um, of processing new information, of retaining new information. This one is similar. Um, I can't remember all those verbs. A response particularly to, to rote learning, things you have to learn by heart. Particularly a challenge, I think, for all the learners, though, though not only. Um, and this one is perhaps slightly different. Um, this one is perhaps more a response to um, the organisation of the class, the way the class is set up. So a very common problem with learners. So these are just some typical examples of the kind of things learners say, the kind of challenges learners have. Um, I'd just like to expand <clears throat> on these and add to this list and ask you to look at these if you can, from a learner's point of view. So you're, look at them as you, from, from your own point of view as a learner, not as a teacher. So think maybe of uh, some time when you have learned a language or tried to learn a language, 
Or if you try to learn, learn something else, it doesn't have to be a language, it could be yoga or IT or anything you have experience of learning, or maybe you're learning now. And just think about them and choose perhaps two or three that stand out for you as being things you have particularly found challenging or particularly find challenging. You might like to just think about this, so I'll just pause for a moment. And if you like, of course, by all means, make some notes in the chat as well. But just think about it for a moment. Okay. Okay. Quite a spread here. I think three and six and four seem to be the most prominent. One reply, they're all challenging. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Okay. Um, let's have a look at the list again. And this time, see if you can sort them into two groups that make sense to you. So are there some, is one group similar in some ways and another group similar in other ways? So just have a think about that for a moment. Okay. okay, here's my answer to this. Um, seems to me that the first three are all somehow to do with the way we process information or deal with items of language, process language and difficulties with that. And the second group seems to me to be all more to do with um, our attitude to learning and the way we feel about the learning experience. And I think um, we could categorize these, we could give them sort of category headings. So I think the first group are generally to do with cognition, in other words, the mental processes involved in learning and getting new information in learning language. And the second group, I think, are more to do with, with learner engagement, and we could categorize them like that has more to do with um, our attitude um, and our engagement with the learning process. Okay, I'm gonna come back to these categories um, in a minute, and we're going, to, we're going to be looking at them more closely later in the webinar. Um, just for a moment though, I'd like to shift attention, um, shift the focus away from um, learning challenges and towards um, our decisions that we make as teachers, because they are, I think, the other side of this coin, and they're also quite important. And just to focus on that, um, well, of course, we want to help learners um, rise to challenges as teachers. And so the question is, how do we do that? And more specifically, um, how do we decide what to do? What decisions do we make as teachers? I'd like to just show you an example um, to illustrate this, here are two different approaches to teaching grammar. So teacher A presents grammar clearly on the board, then does practice. Teacher B lets students work out grammar rules for themselves from the context. You might just look at that and think, well, who are you more like? Are you more like teacher A? Or are you more like teacher B? Or you've got like a mixture of both? Okay. People are responding seem to be mainly B, I think. All seem to be B. Yep. 
I think probably I'm a mixture of the two, actually, myself. I think I'll probably start off as teacher B. In other words, I certainly present rules in context, and then I tend to let students work out the rules, but then I go on to A, exactly as, um, as Jess, Jess has just said, and then go on to A, then I present the grammar um, on the board, and we do practice. So I think you might be a mixture of these two, or you might just remain as more like B. Um, obviously, there's no right or wrong answer to this, and I think a more interesting question is um, not so much what we do, but how do we decide what to do? What's the basis on which we decide which of these approaches we take? Um, and of course, this, this has a connection with, um, with these problems of cognition and engagement we looked at just a minute ago. Um, there might be various bases on which you decide what to do. It might be that you decide based on just gut feeling or common sense. Um, so you might just think, well, you know, this, this seems to work. This seems like a good idea. Um, perfectly valid way of deciding, I think, and something we do a lot as teachers. It might be that you draw on experience, maybe your own experience as a learner, perhaps, or as a teacher. So it might be that you learn grammar in a particular way um, yourself, seem to work for you, so probably you tend to adopt the same approach as a teacher, for example. Um, might be, and probably this is, is true for most of us, um, that you, you base your decisions on observation of your students, maybe very informally, um, and also on feedback from your students. So your students might tell you, for example, that a certain approach to teaching grammar confuses them, and so you avoid it. Um, I think that might be a basis for deciding what to do. And another basis, I think, might be you um, read about the subject, and based on, on research that's been done, on theory, you try to apply some of this, these insights to your own teaching. Um, again, I'm just going to pause for a moment here, just a pause for thought. Just think about your own experience as a teacher. Um, I'm sure you, you, you apply a mixture of these as a, in making your decisions. Which ones do you think dominate in helping you decide what to do and the decisions you take? Just think about this for a few seconds. I'm only going to pause for a very short time. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I think for most of us, we, we generally draw mainly on experience and feedback and observation, um, and we draw, we draw this information from the class itself. Um, the focus of this webinar is going to be mainly on the fourth area of these. In other words, um, we're going to be looking more at what theory and research has to tell us about learning challenges and how we might apply those in practice. Um, and this brings us on to Cambridge Principles of Language Learning, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and in, in this document that Cambridge drew up, um, based on the summary of research, um, they in fact organised this in the categories that we looked at earlier, um, plus one extra one. So the categories they, they look at are um, cognition, so um, the learning process itself and mental processes, engagement, so um, learners' attitude to the learning experience and their engagement with it, and also a third area which they talk about as behaviours, uh, which is more to do with um, learners' um, learning strategies and learning learners' decisions about how they approach the learning process. Here's a summary of the Cambridge Principles of Language Learning. Um, in a kind of chart form, and you can see from this, we're not going to look at this in detail, but just to give you an overview of this, you can see that um, within these sort of general principles that they have collected, there are these three broad categories, and within each category, there are also subcategories. So under cognition, there's the subcategory of cognitive load, consolidation, and so on. Within the broad category of engagement, there are subcategories of curiosity, stimulation, accomplishment, and so on. Um, obviously, we're not going to look in detail at all these. I mean, there wouldn't be time to do so. What I'd like to do is just focus on um, four particular areas, which I think are interesting. 
um, two under cognition and two under engagement. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to look at um, cognitive under cognition. We're going to look at cognitive load, in other words, um, you know, how much learners have to deal with, and also consolidation, so reinforcing learning. And under engagement, we're going to look at social relatedness. So in other words, the, um, the social dimension of learning and also curiosity. Um, so, you know, how, how interest in the lesson in the learning process is stimulated. And with each of these, I'm going to start off from um, by looking at what research has to say about it and summarizing research. And then we're going to look more practically at how we might apply this and what the implications are for classroom teaching um, and look at examples from Empower Second, second Edition um, and see how they might illustrate some of these features. Okay, so let's start off by looking at um, the issue then of cognitive load. And I'd like to show you a quotation here, which is from, excuse me, I'll just move the chat so I can see my screen okay. okay. So my chat is away. Um, a second, okay. This is from um, Alison Mackay, who is an applied linguist um, working in uh, uh, University of California, I believe. And this is what she has to say about cognitive load. She says, there seems to be a consensus in the general second language acquisition literature, okay, so it's research into second language acquisition, that cognitive processes that underlie working memory capacity and attention are related. So what she's really saying here is that um, the um, our working memory, in other words, our, our short-term memory, which is I mean, not exactly the same, but more or less the same. So our short-term memory um, has a limited capacity and student learners' attention depends on the limits of our working memory, of the capacity of our working memory or our short-term memory. Um, so, I'm having trouble moving screen thing. Do a positive. Um, um, this is um, a summary. This is this is what um, research then has to tell us about this: that working memory has a limited capacity, um, and if our working memory is overloaded, then this will inhibit learning. Learners will then be unable to process new information, um, new language input, in other words, and because of that, they will feel overwhelmed and unmotivated. Um, just to, um, because, okay, so what leads then to cognitive overload? Um, there might be a variety of different factors. It may be too much language is focused on in the lesson. Um, it may be that the lesson goes immediately from presentation to freer practice, so learners don't have a chance to kind of play around with the language to absorb new language items. Um, it may be not the language that's too much, but the context. The context may be too complex, so this causes overload. And connected with this, it may well be that the, that the reading texts or the listening texts are over long or over complex. I'm sure you'll have this experience of, of learners getting bogged down in a long reading text um, and cutting out, not being able to absorb any more information. Um, it may be simply that there are too many different activities in the lesson. So there's too much going on, too many different stages. Just to illustrate this, um, I'd like to show you an example of where I think um, there is in fact too much language leading to cognitive overload. And this is an example of a course book lesson. It's not from Empower, it's not from a Cambridge course book, but it's a lesson which um, I, I have observed from a teacher using a course book um, fairly recently as part of teacher training. And um, this was an example of a lesson where I think there was cognitive overload. Um, I'll just describe the lesson to you very, very briefly. Um, so the topic of the lesson was holidays. It was an A2 level lesson. Uh, the grammar focus was uh, going to for future plans. And these were the stages, eight stages to the lesson. So it started off with um, listening text, which is a radio program. This introduced the, uh, the topic of travel. Then there was a second listening, which was people talking about their travel plans. And this introduced, this is a context for the main grammar for going to. This led on to then um, a sort of presentation, if you like, of going to, and also future time expressions like next summer and um, in the autumn and so on. 
Um, this was then practice, so there was pronunciation practice and also uh, controlled practice of going to. Then there was a reading, which was a travel blog, and this, in, this in, it contained vocabulary for um, travel vocabulary, holiday vocabulary. Um, and so then this was introduced through a vocabulary in context activity. Then there was an, another focus on phrases for talking about holidays. Um, things like go sightseeing, for example, um, go sunbathing, and so on. And then there was another focus, which was on making suggestions. Um, let's, um, why don't we, shall we? Um, expressions like this. And then finally, there was a free speaking practice where students talked about their holiday plans. Um, um, what seemed to, to me to happen was that, you know, by the end of the lesson, there had been simply too much going on here and students' attention was cutting out and they weren't really making use. They weren't really using the language that, they're supposed, that they were supposed to be using by the end. Um, just have a look at this for a moment and just see if you can see, I mean, given that there's too much going on here, um, too much language, what, how could this be streamlined? What, could, what stages could perhaps be cut out of this so that there is less language focused on, less cognitive load, but without, of course, destroying the main aim of the lesson and the main teaching point? I'll just pause for a few seconds here, just have a, a think about this. this. Okay, here's my answer to this. Sorry, I'm having problems thinking screen. Uh, thank you. Okay, here's my um, here's my answer to this. Um, it seems to me that probably um, having two listings back to back isn't isn't necessary here. Um, the topic could very easily be introduced just by a simple a simple illustration, and then just perhaps have have one listening. Um, and I think the, the focus on going to is good and the practice is good and it's a good idea to have some reading and introducing the vocabulary. But I think then having another focus on phrases and then a third focus on making suggestions um, is simply introducing too much language. And I think so stages six and seven could easily be dropped um, um, without destroying the lesson and making the lesson more streamlined. So in other words, instead of eight stages, this could be reduced to about five stages. Just by contrast, I'd like to show you a, um, a lesson from Empower where you know, we try to avoid this issue of cognitive overload. Um, and this is also an A2 lesson. I'll just take you through this quickly. Um, the focus here is on food. It's a lesson introducing topic of food. Uh, and there are five stages rather than eight. So first of all, there's a short piece of reading about this man who is a chef in Barcelona, has a restaurant in Barcelona. Um, and there is the reading is about an, an email about somebody who's planning to visit the restaurant. Um, this then, then leads into a vocabulary focus, which as you can see, introduces a set of verbs and adjectives for food, boil, fry, grill, etc. Then there is a pit, then there's practice on this, and then there is a short listening, which is a conversation which recycles this vocabulary um, in which people are talking about their favorite recipes and things they cook. This then leads into, excuse me, <clears throat> this then leads into a presentation of grammar, of quantifiers, not all quantifiers, just a few, much, a lot, many, and a little, um, taken out of the listening. This is then practiced and then there is a final speaking activity where um, students write questions to ask their partner and they interview each other about the food they eat and decide whether they have a healthy diet or not. Um, so here's an example of a lesson where I think there is less cognitive load and it avoids cognitive overload. Um, so there is um, one reading, one listening, one focus on vocabulary, one focus on grammar. Um, all these things are practiced and there is one final activity. And this suggests about some of the ways in which we can make learn language input more manageable. Um, I'm maintaining an ongoing topic focus throughout the lesson, um, limiting receptive skills practice. So just one, one piece of listening, one piece of reading, not too long, 
just one lexical focus, not too big, one grammatical focus, not too much, um, ensuring that all, all the language is practiced. And this then leads, I think, to greater depth of learning rather than just learning a lot. Um, I think we've all had this experience, perhaps, of lessons where we've taught a lot of grammar, a lot of words, lots of words on the board and so on. And we think in this lesson, you know, I really taught a lot in the lesson. But I think a question worth asking is, well, maybe you taught a lot, but did the learners learn a lot? Which, of course, is not at all the same thing. OK, so that's maybe um, an approach to, to reducing cognitive load and the importance of doing that. Let's move on now to um, the other aspect of cognition, which was consolidation. Um, and here is a quotation from a... Uh, I'm just moving my screen down here. Um, here's a quotation... Um, from research, uh, uh, which is a general cognitive research, and it's not specifically about language learning, but includes that. And this is what um, they say here, is successful long-term storage of information includes several steps, starting with the encoding of information, followed by short-term memory storage and consolidation from short-term memory to long-term memory, as well as repeated consolidation. Um, so this really, what, what they're describing here is this process of moving information, or moving input from short, through short-term memory into long-term memory where it is retained and the role of consolidation and repetition in this. Um, and this is what refers tells us about this, that learning requires consolidation um, of knowledge and of skills, so both of um, um, of, of, of formal, learn, formal knowledge and also implicit knowledge, ex explicit learning and implicit learning, and there are um, certain techniques which are known to help with this, uh, which are um, by repeating things at spaced intervals, by elaborating on what we've learned, by incorporating what we've learned into bigger contexts, by rehearsal, and by personalizing what we've learned in contexts about ourselves. Um, various ways we can do this. I think, I mean, one very obvious way, of course, is what is, is very often um, supplied by course books these days. It's kind of standard that course books have, have various add-ons which give further practice of all the items. So we have practice activities, we have workbook tasks, we have revision tasks at the end of the units, we have revision tests, um, we have, um, very importantly these days, also digital content, which offers learners extra consolidation opportunities. So for example, Empower has an interactive online workbook where students can consolidate what they've learned. Um, it has a, 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 um, a, an ongoing um, online testing package and so on. I, I don't want to talk about these things because I think that, you know, they're well known and they're obvious. Um, perhaps a more interesting way in which the language can be consolidated though is um, by introducing language in more than one context, so a kind of inbuilt recycling of the language we introduce. And I'd just like to illustrate this, um, if I can, by just taking you through an example. Um, this is from Empower, B1 level of Empower, uh, where um, I'd just like to um, give you an outline of the way the lessons develop in the unit and show you how language is reintroduced. So as you may know, if you're familiar with, with Empower, uh, every unit has um, a series of four lessons, there's four main lessons, so there's some A, B, C and D, um, and this is a unit from the B1 level, so um, the A lesson then um, is about life-changing events, and it's the main, the language focus is on comparatives and superlatives, the grammar focus, you can see them highlighted here in the text, so comparative adjectives and adverbs and the superlative forms, and also collocations with get. Then in the next lesson, the B lesson, um, it's the same theme generally about lifestyles, but the focus shifts to talking about health and changes in people's lifestyle. And the grammar focus shifts, the main focus here is on used to. So as you can see from the picture, this is about how, how lifestyles have changed from the past to the present. And this is the grammar focus used to and used not to. And also there is a focus on health collocations. So new language is introduced here. 
Then in the third lesson, the C lesson, this goes off into um, a focus on conversational English. Then in the D lesson, the last lesson of, of, the, um, of the unit, there is a focus on write, mainly on writing skills. And again, there is a new language focus. So the focus here is on linking devices for ordering events. So to begin with, after that, at first, see the yellow highlights. Um, so again, it moves into a new area. But um, this text, because it's about a comparison with the past and the present, it naturally recycles the language from the earlier lesson. Um, so there are examples here of used to. He talks about things he used to do. So students have a chance to encounter this language again. Um, there are also examples, because it's about developments, there are examples of comparative um, and superlative forms of adjectives and adverbs. So I hope you can see this is an example of how the language, um, students re-encounter the language through built-in recycling by seeing, seeing the same language in more than one context, which I think is quite a, a valuable and interesting way um, to consolidate the language. This is a textbook, a course book example, but of course it's something you can also do yourself um, in your own classes by reintroducing language in new contexts. Okay, let's go back to the principles of language learning and um, move on now to um, this other main area of engagement. And we're going to look um, first at social relatedness. So the, the language of um, the social aspect of the classroom. And um, I'll show you a, again a quotation from research. This is from um, H.D. Brown from a book I'm sure many of you are familiar with, his principles of uh, language learning and teaching. And um, this is what he says about this. He says, research suggests that saying a learner has a high willingness to communicate, which he calls WTC, willingness to communicate, must be distinguished from simply describing a learner as extroverted, confident, or risk-taking. Um, one of the key contributors to building willingness to communicate seems to be social support. Um, so what he's saying here is that I think um, of course, we want our learners to communicate. We want to create conditions where they're willing to communicate. Um, and to some extent, this depends on their personality as students. But to a large extent, it also depends on the social support in class. Um, in other words, the support network from other learners. Um, and so I think this is what research just um, uh, to summarize what research tells us about this then is that learners need a constructive supporting, supportive learning environment, whether this is in groups or in pairs or whole class. Um, learner interaction needs to be comfortable and learners need a safe space in which they can try out new language, receive feedback and take risks. So we need to create the conditions in the class where learners are more likely to become risk takers and feel comfortable um, and be willing to communicate. I'd just like to illustrate this with an example from my own recent experience. Um, well, not so recent, this was just before um, the beginning of um, the coronavirus pandemic, actually, or some time before it, where um, I decided for various reasons that I wanted to learn Hungarian. So I joined a Hungarian class at my local um, adult education institute here in Munich, um, a class of about 10, 10 students. And um, quite quite highly motivated, we all were. And the teacher herself was, um, was was very pleasant. She was very relaxed. She created a good atmosphere in the classroom. But the activities were more or less all um, centered on the teacher. So we had um, very little opportunity to really interact with each other. And I noticed that because of this, I actually felt quite inhibited about speaking Hungarian course I was a beginner um, because I was talking to people who I didn't really know and it was only at about halfway halfway through the course we went out for a drink together um, and then, then then things got much better but I had a feeling by that time it was a bit too late but it would have been much better if this had happened in the class itself so this was an example of a class not an extreme case but a class where um, social relatedness wasn't really fostered and I think generally this is what might make social relatedness difficult is, I mean, my class wasn't quite as bad as this one probably, but a teacher-centered lesson 
where there is no opportunity to get to know other students, where activities are mainly language focused and not student focused. So the activities don't help students to get to know each other. Um, how to deal with this? Well, clearly one way is by varying interaction so that students have an opportunity to get to know each other. So creating opportunities for student-centered interaction of various kinds, varying this interaction in relation to the activity, whole class, pairs, groups, also mingling, um, repeating speaking activities in new pairs. So getting students to do an activity, then change pairs, do the activity again, so students interact with more than one person in the class. Um, also changing pairs and groups frequently, so that over a period, learners have a chance to, to speak to, to, um, to everybody else in the class. And this not only gives lots of language practice, which of course is one important reason for doing all this, but it also gives a chance for students to get to know more about each other and feel more at ease with each other. So it creates, it generates this feeling of social relatedness. Um, Various ways of doing this apart from I mean, one way is obviously just through the kind of interaction, um, but another way is through the kind of activities that we use. And here are a few examples. These are taken from Empower. Um, um, activities where there is a chance for a personal response. Here's an example from Empower A2 level, um, where students talk about things or places they've, they've been to or seen in their town, and also places they haven't been in their town that they'd like to go to and they compare notes with other students. So it gives language practice, but it also gives students a chance to find out about each other, to find you know, what they have in common with each other, to get to know each other a bit in that way. Um, another example is of course, discussion activities, problem solving activities. Um, here's an example from B1 level. Um, students look at jobs, they decide advantages and disadvantages of the job. Then they talk about which job they think is the hardest, which is the most interesting. Again, this gives practice in language and interaction, but it's also a way of getting to know other students, saying, you know, do you agree or disagree with other students? Do you, what do you have in common with them? Um, learning, learning things from each other as well, breaking down these social barriers. Um, and another aspect of this, which I think is extremely important, is the language of social interaction. Like if we want students to, um, to relate to each other in the class, to interact in the class, it's extremely important to provide them with the language they need to do this. And um, just to focus on this briefly, I'd like to look at some examples um, of some useful expressions, which I think are useful in real life, but they're also very useful in the classroom itself. And I'd just like you to look at these and um, got a very brief task here. Just see if you can match the examples with the functions. So for example, uh, number three, wow, that's incredible, is obviously an example of expressing surprise. D is a way of expressing surprise. Just look at these and match them together. And answer in the chat by all means if you'd like to, or if you'd like, just think about it. Okay. okay, the answers. Well, I think as you can see, these are all functions of language which are both useful in, in everyday life, but also quite important in the classroom in um, helping students to interact with each other. Um, this is something we can also practice, of course, um, in, as part of our teaching. And in Empower, we, we take this quite seriously. We attach quite a lot of importance to it. So the third lesson, the C lesson every unit, deals with language of this kind, um, and especially with, um, with, with strategies for interaction. Here's an example from A2 level, um, for developing conversation skills in responding to opinions. And if you glance down what Celia says, you can see what, you know, here's some useful ways of doing this. 
for agreeing and disagreeing. No, me neither. Yeah, me too. You did? Echo question. Do you think so? Um, and an alternative way of, of saying, saying this. Um, so very simple ways of just responding to opinions. And I think you can see how, how important this is in any kind of discussion activity that's going on in the classroom. Okay, just to pull this together then, I think these are all good ways of encouraging students to communicate and developing this social aspect in the classroom. Um, varying interaction patterns, using speaking activities which allow for a personal response and also an opportunity to spare, share ideas and focusing on communication strategies and the language of interaction. Okay, let's go on finally then. Um, the last area we want to look at, which is again within this area of engagement, and we're going to look at curiosity. Uh, I'd just like to show you two um, quotations here from research. The first one is um, from um, La Nuno and Chase. This is applied linguistics research. Um, and this is what they say about it. They say that classroom studies show that drawing a student's attention to uncertainty by asking guiding questions to help the student recognize what she does not know, or pointing out incomplete information, for example, leads to curiosity. Okay, this is a slightly convoluted and long-winded way um, of saying, I think what, what they're saying here really is that we don't, we don't need to hand students everything on a plate. In other words, it's better if we don't. It's better if we um, create uncertainty um, in say, presenting language or introducing new information so that this arouses students curiosity and they they realize what they don't know and so want to know it um, an example of this is um, um, an example of this is is introducing um, new language by guided discovery um, which we mentioned um, right at the beginning and which we'll look at again in a minute uh, before we go on to this here is a second quotation which I think is quite an interesting point about curiosity. Um, and this comes not from applied linguistics, it comes from, um, um, <clears throat> from research, um, neurological research. And this is from uh, Juhas, who says that studies suggest that when our curiosity is peaked, is aroused, um, changes in the brain ready us to learn not only about the subject in hand, but incidental information too. I think this is quite an interesting point that, um, Studies have shown that um, the part of the brain, a part of the brain shown here, is activated when curiosity is aroused. And that this makes learning generally more active, not only about the topic that the learner is curious about. So it has a generally beneficial effect on learning. Um, I think this is really important because it suggests that, um, you know, we all know that arousing curiosity makes the lesson more interesting but I think there's strong research evidence to suggest that it enhances learning in general as well. Um, so this is what research tells us about it, that curiosity can be triggered then in response to, to uncertainty, to not being given information, surprise and mystery achieve this, and this leads in general to more effective learning. So an example of how this can be done then is um, in presenting language um, through guided discovery, through not presenting language, but letting learners um, come to their own understanding. Uh, here's an example from B1 level of Empower. Um, as you can see, this is a short review of um, the book by Harper Lee, To Kill a Mockingbird. And this contains examples of the passive, the simple present passive and the simple past passive. And you can see here the presentation is it's in the form of concept questions, of guiding questions. So it follows this approach of, of guided discovery. Students are led towards understanding the difference between the active and the passive, um, the meaning and the form of the passive, um, rather than it being presented directly to them. So it takes the same approach as teacher B and many of you who responded earlier on. Um, when we looked at that at the beginning. Um, so that's one way in which we might um, arouse curiosity in language presentation. Um, and of course, other ways apart from this um, are simply, I think, reflections of what we often consider to be good teaching. Um, in other words, things that the teacher introduces uh, 
Oh, uh, beyond the course book, for example, bringing in a picture to arouse curiosity, bringing in something new into the lesson. Um, in writing in power, we tried to incorporate as much as possible of activities of this kind into the book itself, so that teachers don't need to go away from the course book in order to arouse curiosity and do interesting things. I'd like to just show you some examples of this quickly. Um, uh, Yes. Um, okay. Um, one way of doing this, of course, is um, through um, um, activities which, which um, arouse curiosity through prediction activities or discussion activities. Here's an example from the B2 level of Empower. Um, students are going to read um, a text about Antarctica, about a, a chef working in Antarctica. Before they do that, they do a quiz where they have questions about Antarctica to see how much they know about it and then they find out some of the answers when they read the text so this arouses their curiosity in the topic that they come to read um, another example um, is by using pictures um, but of course not all pictures arouse curiosity in the same way um, some pictures i think make you more curious than others so for example um, which of these pictures do you think arouse curiosity more effectively this one, Tokyo Underground, I think, or this one, also the Tokyo Underground. I think clearly the second picture arouses much more curiosity than the first because it has a kind of story behind it, doesn't it? There's something going on that we might want to talk about, we might want to speculate about. You know, who is this person? Why is he wearing these clothes? What do the passengers think about him? And so on. Whereas the other is just a picture and nothing much to say about it. Similarly, very nice picture of a pigeon, but not very much to say about it, unless you're really interested in pigeons. Um, this, however, I think is more interesting picture of pigeons. Um, and it's for the same reason, like, you know, why is she there? What, you know, what, what has she just done? It, how does she feel? Is she happy or isn't she happy? What's gonna happen next? What's she thinking? Lots of questions we immediately might ask and talk about. So it naturally arouses our curiosity. Um, in Empower, every unit begins with a picture of this second type, which is chosen to get the students thinking, get them talking, arouse their curiosity. And we hope because of this, this also enhances their learning right from the start of the unit and gets them involved in the class. Um, is, this picture is from third unit of A2 level and the second unit of B2 level. Okay, um, another way of arising curiosity is of course through texts. And here's an example, I think again from B2 level, I think this is. Um, and as you can see, this is a review of a restaurant um, called The Shed at Dulwich, which is in London. Um, and you can see it got five stars. And this restaurant got rave reviews on, um, on TripAdvisor. Only one strange thing about all this was that the restaurant didn't exist. Um, it was a hoax from start to finish. Uh, this is a guy who, in fact, inspired by the shed in his back garden, thought he'd um, invent a restaurant, which in fact didn't exist, got his friends to write reviews, and he became extremely popular, even though um, there was no such restaurant. Even the pictures, in fact, are fake. Um, I think this is shaving cream and a washing, a dishwashing tablet in that picture. Um, so this is an example then, it's a, it's a restaurant review, but it makes, it makes you wonder, it makes you want to ask more questions. How did he get away with it? What happened in the end? And so on. Um, another example, description of a town, this is from A2 level of Empower. Um, this is a town in Alaska. Um, if you look at this picture, you might think, well, what is unusual, do you think, about this town? It's a, it's a very small town, and it's in Alaska. Okay. Well, two things are unusual, actually. One is that um, you can only get to the town through this tunnel, and one also by sea, I guess, but through this, um, using a railway line and a road through the tunnel. But the main thing that's unusual about it is that the whole town is contained inside this one big building, in fact. So there are flats, there are shops, there are offices, um, there's a school, there's even a church, I think, there's a supermarket, and it's all, the whole, the whole town is within one building. 
quite practical probably um, for the Alaskan climate. Um, so that's an example then of a, a text which is simply describing a town with using there is there are in the standard way, but it's a town which arouses curiosity, which makes you think and makes you talk about it. And this is how it is. This is the text on the page. So it's a surprising story. Um, and the final example, um, Texts about jobs, of course, are standard, um, especially at A2 level, talking about people's jobs. Here is an example, but this is a very unusual job. This is a girl who works in a holiday park in Florida, and her job is um, looking after the alligators in this animal park. Again, it's a text which makes you curious. I think you want to know, well, you know, what's it like? What's her job like? Why does she do it? Is it really dangerous? Are alligators really as dangerous as people think? and so on. So it's a text, but, but it also arouses learners curiosity. Um, it also extends beyond the classroom. I think this is quite an important point because um, these texts are of course real world texts. So you can Google them, you can find out, you can find out about these places. Um, so it's quite possible for the teacher to set as homework, for example, find out one more fact about this holiday park um, or you know, find out, find out how old she is find out what she did next, something like that. So this curiosity can extend beyond the class into, um, into what students do at home as well. So these we looked at a range of possibilities here for um, arousing curiosity. Just to summarize this, different ways of engaging learners um, in language input by using techniques such as guided discovery and questions and eliciting. Um, through activities such as problem solving and guessing, through contexts of different kinds, visuals, narratives, and stories. And this really takes us to the end of this webinar. Just, um, to summarise what we looked at, we looked at some learning challenges in the light of Cambridge principles of language learning, um, and we looked at various aspects of this the cognitive load, and how important it is that learners aren't overwhelmed, uh, consolidation, and the idea of introducing language in more than one context, that social relatedness and paying attention to the social dimension of learning, and a curiosity and the importance of stimulating learning by engaging curiosity. And all these, I think, are ways of, of supporting students and helping to motivate them to learn and to overcome some of these challenges that we looked at at the beginning. So that's it. Thank you very much um, for listening. Um, uh, we've got a rather short time left over for questions, but a tiny bit. Um, here are just some uh, references which you may be interested um, to look at later. Um, these are references to these principles of language learning. You can also simply Google this. If you key into Google Cambridge principles of language learning, you will find uh, quite a good introductory video um, into this. For example, you can find it there. And these are references to the, so which I mentioned as part of the talk, which you also may may want to look at further. So um, that's it for me. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Adrian. Thanks a lot yep. for that. Um, let me just uh, read out a question or two in the in the five minutes that we have remaining. Question from Nada, which is, where do we use the ways of triggering students' curiosity? Is it mainly the warm up activities? Sorry, could you again? Um, can I see these questions, by? Um, it's if you go to the Q and A box, yeah, and just click click on the open. Uh, Let me see that. So she's asking yep. of, of where. Sorry, yeah, we, I'm, I'm there. Yeah, sorry. yeah. Yes. The, the second one down. So uh, where yeah. do we use so, the ways wait. of triggering students' curiosity? Oh, actually, oh. How, how do we use that? Is yeah, I think it's a very, very, very good, very good question. Um, well, I think um, it. Um, I think it should be everywhere. Really. <laughs> So I think, I mean, this is really what I was trying to say, I mean, certainly, certainly it's important in warm-up activities. I think this is a critical, this is a critical moment in the lesson, because um, you want to get learners engaged. And I think, you know, typically this is a point where uh, teachers go away from the book, perhaps you bring in something of a surprise, you know, you come in with a picture, you come in something which has a sort of, you know, it's more interesting than saying turn to page 53. And I would always try and do that, I'd avoid the course book at that point, even if I'm using say a picture from the course book, um, for example, in Power Starts with these pictures, but I wouldn't myself show these pictures on the page 
I, I would put them up on a screen. So I think that's really important. Um, but I think, as I hoped I showed, I, I think curiosity is, is something that you want to generate throughout. I mean, in my lessons, you know, any opportunity I have for kind of creating a surprise, for making, you know, eliciting information rather than giving it in grammar presentations, in vocabulary, um, all those points, really. Um, also in, in free activities, you know, making students curious about each other through personalised activities. Yeah. So yeah. I would say it's, you know, it's, all, it's especially in warm activities, but also elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, that we, we only picked on a few examples, where you, you only picked on a few examples from that that bigger wheel but there are many there's several areas that we that we could have explored so yeah the, the reference the the links that you had um uh would be i don't know if you could put them up again actually that would be the links uh, in your the, final second second yeah time. I, 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 there wasn't time for you know i didn't want to leave it up because it's a lot to read through but uh, um, okay. is it possible for people to will people be able to see this and access it? yeah the, when they watch it again yeah they can yeah okay that's, that. fine. That's, that's fine um yeah. and there's, there's quite a lot there yeah yeah. So one more um, um, question uh, is: What is the ideal number of objectives per session so that a teacher can avoid cognitive overload? So I think you listed yeah, like about five different areas. Five. But it it mm. might well depend on how long the yes, fifty-five minutes. Uh, <laughs> depends. An hour <laughs> session. Yeah. An hour session. I mean, I, I would think rough. You know, with within power, we tend to go for sort of five block. It seems to me there's a natural, there's a natural sort of thread of you know you have a um of what you want to do in, in a in an hour's lesson you know um some reading some listening i mean not necessarily both those always um maybe some grammar some vocabulary you know or maybe maybe not maybe two vocabularies but um and then certainly save time for some freer practice and certainly save time for practice so um i i would say about five i mean it's a rule of thumb yeah and if you find you've got sort of you know eight different things going on then it may be that there's too much going on, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, students learning challenges for me, I think you, you address the point as well. It's for, for me, it's how, how you get on with people learning around you. And if you have a, if you create a, a comfortable atmosphere that, you know, it, it's, it's not always possible, but um, uh, I, I think for me that you can overcome a lot of barriers and, and hurdles yeah. just by feeling relaxed and you're more willing to talk, you're more willing to, to study yeah. this, but that's just my, that's yeah. just my personal Well, that was my, you know, my example of the whole learning class. I mean, you know, the teacher was the teacher relaxed everybody. She was great. The students were relaxed. They were great. But nevertheless, they were strangers. And so I, I, I didn't want to talk to them in a foreign language about myself. Yeah. And so the, the key thing was them not being strangers anymore. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I think we'll leave it there. There's no no further questions in, yeah. and it is. Sorry, um, not to talk about pronunciation. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, another another session, perhaps. But uh, yeah, that's that's the hour. So that's uh, uh, three o'clock here in, in in the UK now. So thanks ever so much, Adrian. And if you look in the you. chat box, you might have to scroll up a a little bit. You will see there there is a link to the certificate of attendance. Um, so you can click on that, and then you'll be able to fill in your name on the certificate. Um, great, so that's it. Thank you um, very much. Thanks a lot, Adrian, again. Yeah, well, thank you all for, for attending and also um, for using the chat box, those of you who, 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 did, who did so as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye.